et sèche-moi ces larmes de crocodile. everybody welcome back to another nature's always right video today is an exciting video because today we're going to learn how to make compost and using a variety of different techniques i'm going to give you guys lots of different options from the basic all the way up to more advanced composting methods so let's check it out so composting is using the decay process of life in order to convert dead material uh, into living organic matter again what you do is you can combine browns and greens and browns are high carbon materials, so like straw, leaves, anything that was green originally and has dried out. Green material are high nitrogen containing components. So those are things like green leaves, grass clippings, manure. So what you do is you combine the carbon brown layer with the green nitrogen, and when it's mixed together and added with water, a chemical process starts that is done by bacteria and the microbiology going on in the soil that you inoculate the compost with. So let's go through all the different ingredients and I'll explain what they are and what they do and why I've collected them. Now in order for the composting process to work, the carbon and nitrogen needs to be in the correct ratio in order to have proper breakdown and reach temperatures of between 130 to 160. So 130 to 160 Fahrenheit is the ideal thermophilic temperatures. So the thermophilic process is when you're taking the compost pile up to these higher temperatures, it cools down, then comes back up and heats up again. So typically you wanna heat your pile. It sh when it cools down, it should heat back up again, maybe two or even three times. Every time you turn your pile, it'll get hotter because you're infusing more oxygen into the pile. So this is a process that takes a while to learn and to get good at. It's going to take practicing many times to making a lot of piles before you start to recognize the amount of browns and greens that go into the pile. I'm going to try to give you guys a basic formula to follow, but as in all of my videos, I'm trying to give you knowledge and understanding so that you can take that and apply it to your context or the materials that you have so they'll give you the best result. Okay guys, so the simple ratio for making compost is you need 60% carbon or browns, 40% nitrogen, and then 10% of that 40% of nitrogen should be a high nitrogen material. So typically that would be animal manure, but if you don't have that, then a high nitrogen vegetable such as uh, beans. So we actually have some leftover bean beds today that we're gonna be using those plants to compost with. Okay, so 60% carbon or browns, 30% regular nitrogens, so just grass clippings and leaves and green leaves and things like that, and then 10% manure or a high nitrogen plant such as a legume or something in the bean family, peas, anything like that. So for our brown or high carbon materials, we're gonna be using leaves today. Every year I get a couple harvests of leaves from our trees around the area. And this is really great. I really believe in using multiple types of carbon so that the microorganisms have a lot of different choices of food sources. Okay, now here we have some brown and some green mixed in because this is actually a lot of chicken manure. This is all of the manure from inside of their coop and that has the highest concentration of manure. So if you ever need to make a quick compost pile, get the manure from their bedding on the inside of the coop. Then inside here we have more carbon, more leaves. If we need more carbon, then I will add in some more of my straw over there. Thank you to Rusty for hooking that up for me. Now, I wanna show you guys this. This has been a really cool thing. Again, my buddy Rusty, such a great friend, has been really helping me out with a lot of materials on the farm, and he gave me these barrels. And these have been really cool because what you can do is if, let's say you um, tear out a bed, but you're not ready to compost yet, you wanna wait a couple more days for some reason, well, if you put it in an airtight bin like this, it really slows down the decomposition because um, a lot of the moisture and the gases that are, are expelled from the plant, they can't escape into the air. So they're trapped in here and it, it just slows down the process. 
So if you have one of these barrels, it's really nice if you need to wait to, to do your composting. Now, I waited a little bit too long on these because I was trying to wait to shoot this video specifically for you guys. So I waited a little bit too long because I got busy with other stuff. So some of this is broken down a little more than I would like. I'd rather have that breakdown going on in the soil so that all of the nutrients and all of that is trapped within the compost cycle and that all those chemical reactions are gonna trap all the nutrients and store them in the soil that we're making. But it's okay, this stuff is still gonna be green enough that it's gonna work really well. And we got tons. Another great composting ingredient, if you have it around, that's a green, is comfrey. So comfrey is considered a compost activator. It's very high in mineral content and a compost activator helps to heat up compost because it has a good amount of nitrogen in it. So comfrey is something that I really like to add a lot of when I have it. So usually every summer I've got, you know, I've got like 30 plants out here in the yard in different places. So I collect all that and then I uh, add it to the, each layer of the pile. Um, that's been really helpful for me as well. Having a small little comfrey patch in your yard is really valuable because you can make, use it to make uh, compost whenever you need extra greens. You can feed it to your chickens. It's a great food for them. Um, you can make uh, beneficial teas out of it as well. There's, there's so many things you can do with that plant. So the last ingredient I'm gonna show you guys, and this is something that you may not have, but it's something that you may wanna look into learning more about, and I'm gonna create a video about how to do this. So this is called bokashi, and that's a Japanese word. Sorry, these chickens won't be quiet. So bokashi grains are infused with lactobacillus, and lactobacillus is an anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic bacteria thrive in oxygen-free environments or low oxygen environments. Our composting process is an aerobic process. So it requires oxygen. <clears throat> and we are gonna be playing with this idea of going between aerobic and anaerobic states. So we're gonna speak more about that later. So this Bokashi, all it is, is food waste. But we've added the lactobacillus grain in here and that grain breaks down and starts eating all the matter in here. Now, why would you wanna do this? So what Bokashi allows you to do is break down food and items that normally you wouldn't put in a compost pile. So things like meat, bones, citrus, eggshells, um, anything I kind of want to have a pre-digestion of that it takes longer to break down or is difficult to break down, you can put in the bokashi bin and that pre-digestion gets it ready to burn up in the compost. Um, it also helps eliminate any dangerous things as well because the lactobacillus takes over and dominates and other pathogens that would be dangerous to humans can't survive within it. There's an easy way to know if your bokashi is healthy and that's by the smell. It's gonna have a very strong pickled or fermented smell. I would not compare it to sauerkraut or kimchi, but it has that essence to it if you smelled those. Lactobacillus is something that's in the air at all times floating around us. Anyways, my buddy Ronnie at Feed the Soil, and I'll put a link to the description in there. He sells Bokashi grain. He makes this here locally in San Diego, um, and that's why I get all of my Bokashi grain. And he's the guy who taught me how to do this system as well. Uh, so huge thanks to you, Ron, and I just love Bokashi. This Bokashi, we can consider it to be a green or high nitrogen material. Okay, so now we gotta combine it all together. So what we're gonna do is create layers of carbon and layers of high nitrogen, and then we'll moisten those layers in between. So the first thing that we'll do is just start to get this wet. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna add a little bit more um, straw on top, just to have a little bit of a different carbon in there, and then it's got some chicken manure in there as well. So what I'm trying to do is make a pile that's at least three by three feet, one meter cube or one yard cube, um, or four by four. If you can go to four by four in your yard, that's the best. A lot of people say that's the minimum size that you need to get that core temperature really hot. And I found that absolutely to be true. The, the bigger the pile, the larger the center core is, which means that's where the most of the heat is gonna be built. So the bigger that core is, greater chance your temperatures will be good. Now the other thing is, I'm gonna give you guys a little 
slight formula here just to get you started, but I don't want you to rely on a recipe or formula ever. I want you to make multiple compost piles and actually get the feel for it so you can make it without a recipe and more based upon feel and the look and how much you have and you know your experience will kind of dictate how the pile is created. So what I'm setting up here is a pile of carbon on the bottom that I'm getting wet and it's going to be about six to eight inches in height and then I'm going to stack a layer of greens on there that's like four inches in height. Something like that. That's close to the ratio of 60-40. Obviously it's not exact. You can be exact with your measurements with compost. I don't do that and I still have success. Um, but there are ways where you can measure everything and have it be exact. But I don't like to do things like that. But if you wanna make compost in like 20 days or 30 days, like some of the people talk about, you have to have it, the material super shredded and then super measured out so that it, it's able to do that. Okay, so we've got a nice carbon layer here. So now I'm gonna add in some greens. Okay, so that's a good first pile of greens. Now I wish that these greens were a little bit more green and less broken down. That'd be a better example for you guys. Use fresher greens. But for my example, these are the greens layer. And because these are so broken down, there's actually a lot of moisture in it already. And there's a lot of soil that got trapped in there. So it's kind of a big muddy mess. So I probably won't have to add as much moisture to this pile because of that. So this is what I'm talking about where a formula can get you into trouble because here I have a situation where my greens are already partially broken down. So now the formula doesn't work as well. So from my past experience, I adjust based upon that. So that's why it's so important to gain understanding rather than a formula. So we've got a layer of brown. We've got a layer of green. The green layer is pretty moist and I already got the, the lower layer moist. So what I want to do now is add in my next layer of browns, then we're going to add water to that. Because there was already soil mixed in with all of these green plants, I don't really need to add inoculant or some extra compost to this because the microbes are in there. So I'm not going to really have to add too much. I'm going to add a couple scoops of my compost. You just need some decaying compost. It doesn't have to be finished compost, it could be partially composted. It just needs to have those microbes in there so they can get in here and start building giant populations of themselves. So the expansion of the population is what causes the heat, is what causes this chemical reaction. So I'll be adding my straw mixed with manure. Okay, now we're gonna need a lot more carbon. I'm trying to spread this manure out real thin at each layer, just because I don't have a ton of it. Okay, so I'm looking for about eight inches on top of my last, and that's eight inches dry, by the way. This is from my other compost pile. It's nice and hot. The heat tells me that there are aerobic microbes in there. So this is gonna be really good. So now when we water this, it's gonna help infuse all this down through the piles. So I like to add my inoculant, uh, my Bokashi at the second or third layer just because you're watering this and a lot of the water will carry down through and go to the bottom so I'd rather have a couple layers that it can filter through and soak in. Okay so this straw is very dry so we need to get it wet. So things that you don't want in your compost pile. You don't want large sticks or twigs or wood chips, anything, any high carbon, woody, Things like this will take a very long time to break down. So you don't want them in there and they'll actually rob nitrogen from the pile. So get things like this out of here. Things like rocks as well, they just uh, interfere with the process, they get in the way and then you don't want your finished compost to have rocks, then you're putting that out in your beds and everything. So always take that stuff out. Now the moisture content is gonna change based upon your materials. And this is why a formula doesn't always work. But now, because I'm using these ingredients, I will probably cut that time in half. So I'll show you guys what the moisture looks like and I'm gonna describe what it's supposed to be like for you. Okay, so we've got that layer decently wet. It's still pretty dry underneath, but we're gonna keep adding more layers um, and then keep watering. So it's gonna cause that to get wet. Plus, once we add our Bokashi, that's gonna cause more moisture in here as well. But what we're going for is a wrung out sponge. If you were to soak a sponge, wring it out, and then you know you'd wipe it on yourself you could feel moisture right and that's that is the kind of moisture that we're looking to have in this pile 
if you add too much moisture to a pile, what it does is it snuffs out all the air pockets um, and then there's not enough oxygen in there, so then it becomes anaerobic, which means lacking oxygen. So adding too much water can be a problem. Not adding enough is also a problem because if it's too dry, the microbes depend on moisture for their chemical process and their life cycle. So there must be enough moisture so that they have access to that so they can expand their population. So it's this very fine balance, but we're looking for that wrung out sponge type of moisture. Yeah, you want your greens and everything to be alive still. These are like broken down. This is what's supposed to be occurring in this pile. And because it's happening in that barrel, this is actually anaerobic. But what we'll do is, is we're gonna flip it. And I'll be showing you this whole process. So from the build till about two months later when this pile's done, I'm gonna show you multiple updates. So we're gonna go through the whole process so you can understand the whole way through. And then if I need to make adjustments, what I do. Now the second greens layer, we've got comfrey, some beans, and then that leftover mush at the bottom there. So I wanna add any soil inoculant to this layer. So let's do brown. And if you don't know, chicken manure is some of the best manure you can use because it is very high in nitrogen and helps the pile heat up to higher temperatures. So that's another reason why you see me spreading this out in every single layer. So you're trying to make really even layers so that the heat's evenly distributed as well. And about on the third day, once this pile reaches max temperature, we're gonna turn this, um, and that's gonna mix up the rest of the, the high nitrogen and get it super mixed so that when we get our final burn, it'll reach those really high temperatures and hopefully we can get up to 150, maybe higher, we'll see. Okay, so now let's get this straw mildly wet. And then what we'll do next is dump the bokashi on top of this. And since the bokashi smells so much, I like to get all the stuff ready to go so I can dump it out, mix it, and then dump a bunch more carbon on top because it's kind of nasty. So the next layer is bokashi. And I just realized I've been forgetting to use my leaves. So normally I'd mix some straw and leaves into that each layer, I just forgot. So the next layer, I'll put a bunch of these leaves. I'll do some bokashi, and then I'll spread out some more plant material. And we're gonna dump leaves on top, and then wet down again. And this is the third layer. And remember, we're trying to get this pile to at a minimum of three feet. Much better to go four feet, or, or even more if you can. So one of the biggest reasons my compost piles have failed, and I think other people's compost piles fail, is because you're not adding enough nitrogen material. Every time my pile just goes up to 130 or 120 and never goes beyond, it's always because I didn't have enough green nitrogen material. So that's, it's just very important that you are using enough. So it looks like I'll have enough material for one last layer. So we're gonna do brown, one more green, and then a final layer of brown to cap it off. And we'll moisten in between those layers, and then we'll be done. Okay, so I always add my small amount of inoculated compost at the top of the brown layer before I water in, so that it helps to spread that microbiology throughout this pile. So all this white that you're seeing, uh, some of it may be mold, but most of it is a type of bacteria, actually. So this is actually gonna be the last layer now because I'm out of greens. I don't have any nitrogen material anymore, so I can't do one more layer. I'd love to do one more layer to get it up higher, but I can't, and that's okay. This pile's still pretty decent in size. It's about three feet, and it's got a good four or five feet in diameter. This will still have a decent enough core to get to good temperature. And then we're gonna monitor that every single day and take records of it all. And I have a little Google spreadsheet that I'll share with everyone. It's just a very simple tracker with simple composting. 
instructions so that you guys can track your own compost very easily. So I just want to show you guys how crazy it is, all these materials. They take a long time to absorb a lot of water. If I just go a couple inches down, it's still pretty dry in there. So this for this top layer, I'm going to let this water in for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And eventually what ends up happening is the water drains through and then at the bottom there'll be a big pool of water and that's when I stop and kind of let the sponge suck it up. I'll check it again, it might need a little bit more. It's sometimes it's difficult to achieve the moisture level. In the beginning, you know, if you have a nice, a better sprinkler than this, it's, it can be a little easier to make the pile. You can even make your own at a half inch drip, like a spiral type drip. I think it would be a little better that drips out water s slowly rather than dumping this much water at a time. Because when you dump this much water, it doesn't allow for these materials to absorb all the water quickly enough and it kind of just drains through and some of it's not all absorbed. So that's something I need to build is just a little uh, attachment for the hose. It's basically a big drip that I can just put on the top. And I think that that will be a much better solution to watering this in. But if it's not wet enough, we'll turn it in about three days. And we'll know that by the temperature. In 48 to 72 hours, this should be at its max temperature. If we built the pile right and if we got enough moisture in there. So we'll check back every day. And I'll be showing you guys the temperatures and we'll adjust anything if it needs to be. Okay, the final step is just going to be to cover all this with a piece of burlap. And the burlap is going to help keep the sun off of it and keep the moisture in. Because we don't really need any radiant heat from the sun. All of the heat is created by the population expansion of the bacteria and fungi. So that is what we rely on. So in order to preserve that, we need to make sure the moisture content stays within. So covering it or building compost piles under trees or in the shade are the best places to make your piles to make sure the moisture content staying consistent for you. Okay, so after letting that water run for quite a long time, nice, I've got pretty good moisture content. It's pretty moist down to the greens layer, which is really good. I bet it could use even more moisture though. So I'm actually gonna come and just manly spray all around this thing so that the water penetrates better than the sprinkler. And then last thing, I'm going to toss some burlap on. It takes quite a bit of water to get this wet. So that's something that's really important though. And I almost could get it even wetter because I can still see dry spots in the sides and everything. But as the breakdown process starts to happen, things will kind of liquefy in there. Those greens will liquefy and by osmosis kind of get sucked up by all the carbon. And then that process really gets going. So what we're going to do is cover this now. You don't want this pile to be sopping wet, because then we're going to have anaerobic problems. But if we ever do have an anaerobic problem, it's really easy to address it and fix it. And you just simply spread apart the pile and let it dry out. But I'll show you guys more about that later. Okay, and then we're going to measure our compost every day with this simple Rio Temp thermometer. And Rio Temp makes, in my opinion, the best thermometers for the price. The quality is excellent. This is just a $20 one off of Amazon, and it's set up really simple for the home composter. It even gives you your zones of uh, when your piles are active. And I'll put a link to it in the description. This is perfect for a small little pile like this. But Rio Temp also makes really professional grade ones for large piles, like professionally made compost. So I'd recommend this one. It's worked great for me for over a year and a half. We'll just cover this pile up the best we can, and then tomorrow we'll come and measure it. Oh, but right now, after, right after making it, the pile is stable at 80, which is the air temperature currently. Okay guys, so less than 24 hours later, let's take a look at the temperature. Alright, did it. So we're looking at, what is that? 148, almost 150. So that's awesome, that's, that's, uh, that's exactly where we want the temperature. I'm going to continue to monitor it, I'm going to let it go another 24 hours for sure, let it go 48, see what's happening, and then um, Probably on the third day after a full 72 hours, I'll then turn the pile. And I've been trying to get my compost techniques better and better, trying to learn more. And something that I learned um, from Elaine Ingham is turning the pile more often and at certain times. So 
Usually she recommends turning it about the third day because that's when the heat is gonna peak out. Uh, at that point, you would wanna turn it, infuse more oxygen in there. After about three days, it's possible certain areas of the pile could start going anaerobic. Um, another reason that I found it beneficial to turn the pile first few days at peak heat is because, you know, we created those layers and there's a lot of high nitrogen stuff in there. But if I just uh, let it heat up and then cool down to like 120, that's what I used to do. Uh, when that happens, sometimes when you turn the pile, so much of that high nitrogen material has been burned up already that when you mix the pile again, there's not like as much of that remaining high, high nitrogen to force the, the temperature to go back up to 150, the really high temperatures again. Um, so I found that turning it at more specific times is more beneficial. And I'm trying to get better and better at that all the time. Check out Elaine Ingham's website. I'll put a link in the description. And uh, she's got some really great tips on composting. Oh, and then one more thing. So another tip from Elaine. Um, this is a really cool way to see if your pile is anaerobic without pulling it apart. So what is anaerobic? bacteria smell like? Well, it smells like poop or something rotting, like a dead rat, something like that is what anaerobic smells like. I push the thermometer into the pile here, then I can smell it, right? And if I smell something gross on there, then it might be time to turn it. This smelled good. It kind of smelled like hot manure. It didn't smell like dead, gross, uh, rotting, putrefying stuff. So we're still okay here. You know, Elaine, Elaine recommends if you ever smell any anaerobicness, immediately, boom, turn it. Yeah, anytime you start to feel that your pile's going anaerobic, you need to turn it because we need to infuse more oxygen in there. I'm trying to keep the heat at this heat for as many days as possible. You know, ideally, I want to do it at least three days, turn it, have the pile remain at heat, turn it again, remain at heat. I believe the organic standards, if you're doing like a large pile for large commercial organic soil makers, I think it's something like they have to bring the pile above 130 for 15 days straight and turn the pile five times during that time and it has to remain at that heat the entire time. By doing that, you're killing off all pathogens and then it is soil that's completely free of weed seeds. And that's what I usually try to attempt to do. I wanna have at least 15 days above 130. And the key to doing that is making sure you have enough nitrogen material in here, keeping the moisture good, all of these different things. You know, but of course in a backyard compost, you don't need to go to those links. If you let a pile sit for three months or four months, it's gonna be fine. So even though I'm talking about pathogens and all this stuff, I'm speaking about it because it's, it's good to understand it and know what to avoid and what to look for. As long as your soil smells neutral, you're fine. You know, don't even worry about it. But um, you know, if the, at the end of making compost, it still is like wet and soggy and smells like death, well, you got a problem. Yeah, I wouldn't use that soil. As long as you're following this process, keeping it to temperature, turning it, making sure it never goes anaerobic, you'll never ever have those problems. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode about making a compost pile. The episode got a little long, so I actually split it into two episodes. So this is just about making the pile. The next episode that'll come out in the next couple days is all about how to turn the compost pile, how to measure it, how to analyze it, make sure everything's going well, staying aerobic. 